So good afternoon, everyone. Please take your seat. I'm Bill Spaniel. I'm the head of uh, bank supervision here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. And it's my distinct honor today to moderate our fireside chat with Adrian Harris. Uh, Adrian Harris was confirmed by the New York State Senate in January of 22 as the head of the New York State Department of Financial Services. She's had a long, distinguished career. She was an associate at Sullivan and Cromwell in New York. She also was, uh, accepted a position uh, in the United States Department of Treasury under President Obama, where she worked closely and was a senior advisor to uh, Acting Deputy Secretary and Undersecretary for Domestic Finance, Mary Milley, as well as Deputy Secretary Sarah Bloom Raskin, who I also knew when she was at the board. She worked on a wide range of financial reforms, including the student loan crisis, foreign investments, and national security, and also on financial inclusion and health in communities. Following her time at the Treasury, she joined the White House and was a special assistant to the president for economic policy during the Obama administration. She also was responsible and did a great deal of work in implementing the Dodd-Frank Act and consumer protections for the American public that came out of that act. She left the White House in, in January of 2017 and served as general counsel and chief business officer for a state's title incorporated, which is now DOMA, which provided a more efficient, cost-effective way for people to close on their homes. Prior to being nominated, she was also a professor at the University of Michigan, the Gerald R. Ford School of Business, um, which we love professors here in Philadelphia. <laughs> so with that, let me introduce Adrian Harris. So let's get started. So first, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. We really appreciate it. And I must confess that I am jealous of many of my state supervisors, especially the Department of Finance Services, because you have a much broader remit than I do and a much broader scope and in some ways um, are an incubator of many things that we think about at the federal level. So congratulations for that. But I'm wondering, um, after your long career, both on private sector, public sector, what, what's kind of brought you back to the Department of Financial Services and what's the passion that brings you um, to the role you have today? Well, it's so good to be here with you. Thanks for having me, President Harker. It's great to be here with all of you. Um, I had worked in and around the Department of Financial Services my whole career, first as a defense attorney, sort of receiving those 4.30 p.m. Friday subpoenas that they so often sent, um, and then including in my time in Washington. Um, and was very eager to get back to public service. As you noted, my, my whole career has really been financial services from S&C to the administration to the insure tech company I started and then uh, went public. Um, but for me, it's, it was the broad remit that DFS has. I mean, we, many folks don't know, we regulate state chartered banks, we regulate 80 foreign banks, 17 of the 30 GSIBs are our regulated entities. We regulate several thousand insurance companies. We're the group-wide supervisor for AIG and MetLife. Uh, we're really the only prudential regulator of crypto, um, including licensing, supervision, examination, enforcement, um, all up and down the line. Um, debt collectors, student loan servicers, mortgage servicers, you name it, it sort of falls under our umbrella. Um, and the great thing about that is to, is to have that capability and to be in the financial capital of the world and really be a global regulator in that sense because we are in New York, because we regulate so many foreign institutions. But then to your point, to have the, the nimbleness to be able to see something happening in the marketplace and act quickly. Um, I know we'll talk more about some of the things we've done on, on stablecoin and, and crypto, um, but to be able to, to get the authority we need when we need added authority, right, to issue guidance, to, to do things on climate, you know, and with fintech, we just have the ability to move much more quickly and see across the entire financial services spectrum um, in a way that really is quite unique and it makes it an incredibly attractive post. And I, you know, when I came into the, the job and I, I met with the governor and I was sort of listing the things that I thought DFS could do but hadn't done, um, and some of the things that I thought were really holding it back from resources to technology. Um, and I thought I was sort of giving her a list of things that she could then pass on to somebody else, uh, but that wasn't the way it worked out. Um, but it, it, you know, it's just an incredible opportunity to, to be at the helm of a fantastic shop in the center of the financial world. So, so let me follow on a bit about that. So that is quite an expansive group of institutions, concerns to regulate. 
Um, and as you know, as regulators, uh, we're often accused of being a little bit behind the curve mm -hmm. and maybe not as forward thinking as we need to be. How are you thinking of trying to position the department to be really a regulator that's a little bit ahead of the curve and maybe a regulator of the future in some respects? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it helps to be sitting literally with, with Wall Street, right, and to be in New York. And one of the things that's been very important to me coming into the role is to make sure that we have that engagement with industry, with academia, with other regulators, um, and that we're, we're always sort of thinking ahead. And because we do have the authority on crypto, we've really been able to, to do quite a lot there. I mean, folks may not know, but the New York Department of Financial Services has been regulating crypto since 2015, um, both through our bit license and our limited purpose trust charter. Um, and we've got all the protections in place. I often tell people, if you were to step back and say, what does regulating this marketplace look like? What does good look like? You would say it's got to have cybersecurity protections and AML protections and capitalization requirements and attestation, right? And, and, and. And those are all the things we have in our framework. Um, but it does take a lot of time and, and work and energy to stay abreast of, of developments. And I'm really proud of, of a lot of the work that we've done on that front. So, so let me ask this question and kind of follow up on that. And I'll go a tiny bit mm -hmm. off script. What has been the reaction from those that you're supervising in terms of that framework? Is it, is it positive in terms of these are good rules of the game? I can follow this as a roadmap. What, how are people reacting to the framework? Yeah, it's a very positive response. We see, I think, contrary to the narrative that exists about a race to the bottom, we just see demand for the bit license and the limited purpose trust charter go up and to the right. I mean, we cannot keep up with the demand for this license. Now, we're obviously um, very careful and we do a lot of diligence before granting the licenses. In fact, you know, several of the companies um, who have recently sort of suffered the fate of the crypto winter were, were folks that were either in queue and, you know, likely would have been denied or, you know, had not made it through the gauntlet yet. Um, but we, we really do see that Folks want that rigor, they want that clarity, they want that transparency. And what we hear from the companies and frankly from other regulators domestically and internationally is, well, we know if somebody got through New York, they're good to go. It really is the, the stamp of approval, the, the housekeeping, the good housekeeping seal. Um, and that's incredibly gratifying, but this market moves so quickly. We know there's still a lot of work to do to, to tick and tie and make sure we're keeping abreast of developments. So, so one more follow on, and then I want to go to some under, underserved and some other things today. But given that pace and the volume you're experiencing, how are you trying to keep the department up with the actual the pace of the pace of the industry and, yeah. and stay abreast of every new development and every new structure and every new thing people are thinking yeah. about? Well, actually, I spent one of the first things I did when I came in is I spent the first six months of my time doing a rigorous staffing and resourcing analysis. So I went through and I looked at all of our statutory mandates. I looked at all of the markets and, and entities that we regulate. I said, how many people do we have stacked up against this? How do we compare to our peer regulators? How do we compare to the, the regional banks? How do we compare to the California Department of Insurance? Um, and I went to the governor and the, and the Department of Budget and I said, I need a lot more people. I need more funding. Thankfully, they gave it to me very quickly. I think we, we made a very compelling case. But the other part of it, especially when we talk about crypto, is uh, operational excellence. And one of the things I, we talk a lot about on the team is the three Ps, which are people, policy, and process. And I'll take them a little out of order. On, on policy, it really is my belief that you can be good for business, good for markets, good for consumers all together. Those things are not mutually exclusive. And I think, unfortunately, in the regulatory world, things are, are framed that way. But I actually think you can do all of those things together. Um, on process, everything we do, we look to do with operational excellence. So when I came in, there just wasn't a lot of process management. We didn't have KPIs. We didn't measure how long it took us to assess a different application to assess a dividend request for an insurance company. So we started to measure those things and where are the bottlenecks? Why is that happening? How do we systematize? How do we standardize? So we started to roll out that kind of work across the department so that we have operational intelligence and operational excellence. But then none of this is possible without people. And this goes back to the staffing analysis. 
Um, so the department's going to be growing quite a bit um, over the, the coming years, and every year we'll be making the case for, for more resources, and it, both in terms of human capital and technology. No, I can appreciate that. And since President Harker's here, I just, you know, uh, budget's important, Pat, but <laughs> we'll be doing the Federal Reserve budget at the end of the year, so I just got to get my plug in for budget's important. So today and yesterday, we heard a lot about fintech and its potential for inclusion, its potential for reaching people who are not traditionally banked, its potential for under, uh, underserved, low to moderate. Um, and I think there is some evidence that that is happening. We've done some research that there can be and that their use of alternate inf information helps apply people for credit. But what's been your experience kind of on the ground and what it means to you to make sure that FinTech is actually delivering on some of those promises? Well, it's interesting. I am the first non-prosecutor in my role. Um, I'm also the first person of color in my role. So when we talk about, and I spent a, you know, a career thinking about inclusion and financial services. So for me, it's really important to bring my lived experience to this role. I think about you know, my mother who grew up in the housing projects in the Bronx, my father who grew up in, in segregated Baltimore, um, and really bring that framing to everything that we do. How does this impact our ultimate customer. Um, so we've done a number of things in the department, I think, to enhance that, that view of things. First, I've actually allowed, um, subject to ethics guidelines and, and the counsel of my um, Office of General Counsel, we allow our team to invest in crypto. Um, and part of that was competitive, right? It is a war for talent. I tell the team all the time, I'm like, it's the Hunger Games out there. You gotta do whatever you gotta do to get people in the door. But the other part of that was, as a regulator, we should have the experience that our consumers are having, right? We should know what the onboarding feels like. We should know if the disclosure language is too small for anybody to read, too confusing, right? We should understand um, how that works. Um, you know, but we do push quite a lot, I think, for FinTech, for crypto, um, there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of marketing about inclusion and democratization, but the first adopters are still a homogeneous group. They're, you know, largely already included. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot of work and you'll see it soon in the form of, of guidance or other things that we do in the department, pushing our regulated entities to be more inclusive. The other thing we really spend a lot of time thinking about is when you think about our, our conduct mandate and our safety and soundness mandate, are there parts of these mandates that are anti-inclusive, right? We have to think about financial inclusion as part of safety and soundness, as, as part of conduct. But I think historically, when we think about safety and soundness in particular, the unintended consequence of that is we may be excluding people from the system. And it's true whether you're talking about incumbent institutions or new and digital institutions. And so we're trying to change our lens around that um, quite a bit. But I would say, you know, for me, I don't think about FinTech and crypto differently than I think about incumbent institutions. There, there should be a mandate to be inclusive. We have to think about how we put in place rules of the road that help with that mission. And sometimes how we take some, some things off the table in terms of regulations that are out of date that might be preventing inclusion. Um, and then sometimes it's just bringing a beginner's mind to things. So one of the things I did uh, in December, I came to my desk, it was, um, we were talking about this at lunch, the, the annual approval for check cashing fees in New York came across my desk and it was like, here it is, sign it, this happens every year, it's happened for 25 years. Um, and I started to read through it and check cashing fees in New York at the time were tied to CPI. So we were looking at this astronomical increase for check cashing fees. And I, I sort of said, well, are they waiting for semiconductor chips to come out of the port so they can cash checks? Like, I don't understand why this is, is tacked to CPI. My team was like, yeah, but they get this every year, sign it. And I was like, oh, clearly you haven't spent that much time with me yet. Let's uh, slow down. Um, so I froze check cashing fees at 2021 levels. And then we proposed a new regulation with a new methodology for setting fees. And so I think a lot of inclusion is just being willing to look at things that are on the books, look at patterns and practices or what one of my state colleagues calls uh, folk law 
and say, does this make sense? Right? Just does it make sense? And what effect is it really having on our customers? The last thing I will say on this, because it's one of my favorite things and my team really, really is upset with me about it, but I think it's pretty great. Um, we, we spend so much time with the general counsels of X institutions and the CEOs of Y institutions. And those are in some respects, our customers, right? We are examining them, helping to find problems in those institutions before they metastasize. But ultimately, Joe Citizen New Yorker is our customer. So this year, much to the chagrin of many of my, many members of my team, we are going to the state fair in uh, north of Albany for the whole week just to talk to New Yorkers. So it, whether you're an examiner, whether you're an executive, whether you do crypto, whether you do insurance, you are eating fried pickles and admiring butter sculptures and I am hell-bent on putting a blue ribbon on a zucchini or something, um, but we're gonna do that this summer as well. So um, that is fascinating and it is really exciting to hear you do that because, it, and I'll give my own anecdote, um, the pandemic I thought has taught a lot of regulars, do we need to rethink at some of our legacy? Yeah. So the Federal Reserve and many of it went into the pandemic saying, we need to not adapt our normal risk management approaches and our normal approach to, you know, this borrower is in trouble, what do you do? And we actually tried to allow the bankers to manage risk better largely on the reason that the pandemic was no one's fault. So how do you, how do you assess that? That seems to have worked well. Um, I think, you know, I think with a guideline of yours, it may work well in crypto and those things, but it, but it really is this fallacy of the past was not necessarily prologue for this. Yeah. And I'm less sure what's going to happen at the next crisis as we begin to see some of these things. So it's really fascinating. And particularly uh, President Hark and I were in Trenton with small businesses yeah. and there is no substitute for finding out what, and as Pat often says, the economy is not the market and it's not the big banks, it's people working every day. So I, I commend you for that. And Absolutely. good luck if you're judging like a pie contest. Yeah, or well, I was really hoping to like do something with cows or pigs or something. My team was like, maybe squash. And I was like, all right, all right. So, so you spoke a little bit about your leadership in the crypto space and particularly with a framework and, and you know, more prudential regulations and even more traditional framework around stablecoin and the blockchain's analytics guidance. What more should we expect from you as you kind of evolve this and you learn as you go? What do you think is the next step in terms of your regulatory or your supervisory posture on these? Yeah, things? well, we have, there's so much more to do and it's changing all the time. But again, just to back up, I mean, we, we license with the bit license and the limited purpose trust. We have, we examine these companies. We also have bespoke supervisory agreements with each of our crypto licensees. Um, so we can, and we also have new product approval authority, new coin approval authority, right? So we really are following along every development. And it's not as if once you're licensed in New York, it's, it's off to the races. We really do scrub material changes of business, right? Other things um, like that. Part of what we did with the blockchain analytics guidance and the stablecoin guidance is we looked at what was in those bespoke supervisory agreements. And we said, okay, well, there are some basic principles that apply across the board. Let's pull those together, make them public in the form of guidance so that people who wanna be in New York understand the expectations. Those are all out there and transparent. For those who are already in New York, they understand that these are guidelines that, that apply across the board. Um, so for blockchain analytics, you know, we're thinking about AML issues and transaction monitoring. And we said, okay, tech companies, we expect you to use tech. We have been shocked in the number of investigations that we've done where these, you know, these tech companies were digital first, you should treat us differently. And you go in and there's a paper stack of SARS. And you're like, but even the big banks don't have paper stacks of stars, of stars. Um, so we said, it's our expectation that you will use blockchain analytics software to do transaction monitoring and, and other things that you're supposed to do. But not only that, we ourselves are using these technologies to assess compliance. And I think that's part of being a forward-looking regulator. The same on stablecoin. I had a reporter ask me um, if we did the stablecoin guidance in response to the algorithmic Stable coins, and I was like, clearly, you've never been in government. This stuff takes forever. <laughs> to, like, we we started this a long time ago, um, but it it wasn't that. We actually only in New York, we've only approved 
USD backed stable coins for issuance and, and being offered in New York. But we took what was in our supervisory agreements and we said, okay, well, we're requiring the same things of a lot of these issuers. So let's make it public and transparent one to one reserving with cash or cash equivalents to on chain um, tokens. T plus two redeemability attestation requirements, right? On and on. Um, I think when we think about what's to come, we're spending a lot of time thinking about NFTs, DeFi, like like many others are. Um, so there will be, you know, we we think a lot about how our banks interact with with crypto as well. And so you'll hear more from the department on those things soon. So let me follow up on that one point because I'd be interested in your perspective on how your traditional supervised entities have reacted to the licensing and particularly to the framework. Has it, has it given them some comfort about who they can deal with? Or are they like, are you, are you letting the cat out of the bag or the, hen, the, the fox into the hen house? No, I think it does give them comfort. A, they know that we have incredible expertise in the department, that we're uh, very forward looking and, and ahead of where a lot of other regulators are both domestically and internationally. So I do think that gives the banks comfort. Um, we assess for any of our banking institutions that want to be in crypto, they have to come to us for prior approval. And we're in the process now of putting together guidance, what the expectations are there, whether or not you want to you know, take deposits from a crypto company, have um, you know, custodial relationships. You, if you're a bank and you want to issue your own stable coin. Um, so those are all things I think we'll, we'll be in a position to put out this year. But our banking institutions, we have really great relationships. And I think, again, it goes to having the proximity with your regulated entities that they know they can come in and sort of talk through things they're thinking about um, with us and that we will provide them that guidance. So, so clearly the framework has given you a level of stability and knowledge um, that others are not at yet. However, you know, there have been some really recent unpredictable events in the market, particularly around crypto, whether it's the demise of Terra USD, hacks on losses, uh, proliferation of consumer uh, scams, and also just a lot of retail marketing of these things. Even, you know, the, I can buy a piece of Bitcoin. And so, you know, the customer base is expanding. Um, given that you have the framework, which is helpful, but but how has that either assisted you or how do you need to go further to ensure there's a level of market integrity that I think, you know, consumers would expect? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's just always more we can do. Um, you'll hear more from us soon on uh, disclosures that we require in our supervisory agreements, but we're, we're looking to put that in the form of guidance, make that transparent. Um, and I think we're spending quite a bit of time with our state legislature up in Albany next session, too, to think about the ways that we can expand our authority to make sure we're staying in front of new risks. So um, I'm going to ask this question. I'm assuming most of the framework of that is on your website? Yes. So that if I tell all my examiners, please go read this, yes. they can do that. Absolutely. I can do that. So as you talked about going to the legislator and talking about new bills, so, you know, Senators Loomis and Gillibrand have introduced Ledger to create a federal regulatory framework um, for digital assets. And, you know, we work closely with the states here at the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. We've been partners in this for a long time. So I'm interested in, you know, what are your thoughts on the bills or the executive actions or what at the federal level should we be hoping for comes out either from legislation or from the frameworks we may adopt as regulators? Yeah, I think it's wonderful um, that we're seeing so much activity and, and interest, whether it's the president's EO or, or bills coming out of the Hill. Um, we are deeply engaged with con congressional members, both sides of the aisle, both chambers. Um, you know, I think the word is out on how robust the New York framework is. And so a lot of people come to us and ask us to take a look at what they're doing, offer our thoughts. Um, and we're, we're always happy to do so because having a strong national regulatory framework is going to benefit everybody. Um, so we spent a lot of time with Senators Gillibrand and Lummis. Uh, we did the same with the folks in the House Financial Services Committee, you know, and Senate Ag, House Ag. Um, and it's there's just really constructive dialogues. And I think part of that is, um, you know, because we're we're involved in the space, but not of D.C. Um, and so we can we can look at legislation or talk to legislators and just sort of call balls and strikes. Um, you know, and then we do have this great framework where we say, if you want to know what good looks like, right, this, we think this is what good looks like. Um, 
And so that's been just incredibly gratifying. We do the same thing um, with international regulators as well. In June, I was in um, London, Paris, and, and Frankfurt. We talk with MAS, you know, Bundesbank, uh, Bank of England. You know, we're in constant dialogue, FCA, others, um, as they all start to think about what does this look like? How are we regulating this space? Um, so we're, we're always grateful for that engagement. And we learn a ton from it as well, of course. So today and yesterday, there was a panel on the future, and a lot of this was predicated upon, and as you talked about going to the New York State Fair, it, it's... I'm really well, excited about that. I think that. it's going to be great. <laughs> I, you know, it's a great opportunity. Um, a lot of this is predicated on, uh, particularly for regulators, the trust people have in us as regulators, the trust that your framework is going to ensure some level of safety when they're dealing with these crypto companies that are licensed. How, how do you think that's going to play out in the public in terms of you, you know, being responsible in some ways and having licensing, but also ensuring people that, that there is a level of trust that this is a safer place than other places that aren't necessarily regulated? Yeah, I mean, it's it's always very tricky, right, because there's added safety when you have a consumer dealing with a regulated versus an unregulated entity, but of course nothing is perfectly safe. And, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about this, as, as does the team, because you want to regulate in a way that keeps consumers safe. You don't want to regulate in a way that locks in gains for a certain set of early adopters and then shuts everybody else out of the space. Um, but there's really no good or clear answer um, on how to do that. We are doing a lot around consumer education. That'll be part of our booth at the state fair. Um, we also now have the State Office of Financial Inclusion and Empowerment, which, um, which was stood up and fully funded by the state legislature uh, this, le this past legislative session. So we'll really be leveraging that to help uh, to help educate consumers as well, but it really is one of those things that keeps me up at night. Is is how do you protect consumers, especially in a space that's hard to understand, is moving very quickly, without shutting people out and and really cementing the gains that some people were able to make by being early adopters. I think that's a really hard question. So um, I know you're on a tight schedule yeah. today, and this will be my second. To I get last nervous question. when I'm outside the state. No, I understand. <laughs> this will be my second to last question. Um, and maybe I'll flip this. What can either people in this room who represent the industry, what can federal regulators, what would you encourage us to do to assist you in this path? And, well, we, we always encourage people to take a look at the New York framework because I, I really do think, bias aside, um, that if you're thinking about what does good look like in regulating the space, we have those elements um, in what we do. But I also think, you know, it's this is an area that's so easy to politicize um, or to talk about, you know, the enforcement and the and the bad behavior. But as with anything we do in the in the regulatory space, it should be a balanced approach of what is our objective here? What do we want financial services to be and do? And then how do we leverage all of our tools, rulemaking, guidance, enforcement? to achieve those objectives. Um, and that's really, you know, what we seek to do with the department every day. Um, so that's always, you know, my ask of all of us as, as we engage together in, in this space is, what do we want financial services to do to be and to look like? And then how do we work together to get there? So as you said, you have a broad remit of traditional financial services, emerging financial services, financial services that are very community-based, financial services that are international-based. Most of the branches and agencies of foreign banks reside within your remit. Um, given your perspective and where you are, what would you like to see or what do you see as the financial services landscape over the next five to six years? Yeah, you know, um, if I really knew the answer to that, I might be in a different line <laughs> of, of work, I'm a more lucrative line of work, maybe. I... Well, certainly when we talk about crypto, but I think the same is true for financial services more broadly, given all the technological innovation. I often liken the space to Amazon 20 years ago. If you rewind the tape to when Amazon was just selling books and somebody said to you, it's going to be AWS and drones and they're a small business lender and they, you know, and it's AI and all this stuff, you would have been like, they sell books. Like, relax, they sell books. Um, and it feels like that's sort of where we are with crypto and with technological innovation in financial services, right? Like we're, 
we're selling books right now or the regulated entities are, are selling books and who even knows five years, 10 years, um, 20 years, what's to come. The caveat to that, I think, that we've seen with the crypto winter, the most recent crypto winter, is we've also seen history sort of repeat itself, right? The, the same leverage that was in the banking system that took 50 years to build up and then came crashing down in, in 2008, sort of built up in five years, was more contained, but we, we saw the same sort of storyline. Um, so while I think it's hard to predict what financial services will look like, we know there will be certain themes that repeat themselves, and I think it's incumbent upon the regulators and the industry to be prepared for those kind of things. So thank you again for taking the time and for being here. We really are appreciative of the time and effort that you take and the partnership we've had mm -hmm. with you. I want to give you the last word. Is there anything else you'd like to leave us with before you're whisked back to New York for important <laughs> business? No, I think we, we covered any, everything. So thank you for having me. It's good to see some friendly faces in the crowd.